20B 練習問題「英日逐次通訳」練習1 Could I begin by expressing my thanks to the Japan Press Club for its kind invitation to me to meet with you here today to discuss my visit, which ends in a few hours. I came to Japan both to explain the policies of the new Australian government and to seek from your government and from Japanese companies the clearest possible indications of Japan's attitudes and needs. I have received, received much information about plans for the future development of Japan's industry, about your forecasts of Japan's raw material and energy needs, and about its intentions regarding the importation of foodstuffs. Japan needs assured, stable sources of supply for raw materials, energy sources, and foodstuffs. She needs to be certain that she can obtain these things at fair and reasonable market prices. We in Australia can give Japan assured, stable sources of supply. We can only do this, however, if Japan in turn offers us an assured, stable market at reasonable prices for the raw materials, energy sources, and foodstuffs we can supply and want to supply. Over the last week, I have been given information which indicates quite clearly that Japan will want growing quantities of raw material and energy sources from Australia. I have been assured that Japan will offer a market of the size, the growth potential, and the certainty that will justify and stimulate the development which will be needed in Australia to meet your needs. And in return for the assurances I have received, I have in turn given assurances of Australia's capacity, willingness, and intention to provide, at fair and reasonable market prices, those things Japan needs from Australia. I have also given assurances concerning Australia's capacity, willingness, and intention to buy from Japan. It might be valuable if I were to refer to one or two matters on which it is important that there be no misunderstanding. The new government in Australia, like the Japanese government, is committed to the private enterprise system. This means that the Australian government will be looking primarily to the private sector in both Australia and Japan to seek out trading opportunities. To find new resources, to marshal capital, to develop projects and their infrastructures, and to negotiate and carry out contracts. However, it would be wrong for anyone to interpret this policy of the Australian government as one of disinterest in the activities of the private sector. We will not simply allow the private sector. To fend for itself without firm and constructive government encouragement, or ignore our fundamental responsibility of providing a sound, healthy, and stimulating economic environment. My government, like the Japanese government, has a deep concern for the needs and the future of its nation and people. If my government sees the private sector acting in a way which it believes is not in the national interest of Australia, it will act in an appropriate way. For example, if I believe that commercial arrangements made or being contemplated by Australian or Japanese interests or any other country are unsatisfactory from the point of view of Australia's total interest, I will not hesitate to step in. My government will retain the existing export control arrangements in relation to mineral exports. While we will look primarily to the private sector to carry on commercial negotiations and to make and perform the practical arrangements of our trade, 
we will exercise surveillance over those activities and, if it should prove necessary, we will act to ensure that those activities do not prejudice Australia's interests. Let me hasten to assure you that I will at all times have very much in mind and I will fully honour my undertakings on behalf of the Australian Government to see that Japan is provided by Australia with those things she needs from us and which we are able to supply at fair and reasonable market prices. There will be no capricious action on my part nor any unreasonable or unnecessary action. I mentioned at the beginning that I came to Japan to explain Australia's policies and to seek information from the Japanese government and the Japanese industry. I believe those purposes have been very satisfactorily achieved in talks which have been marked by a real spirit of cooperation and cordiality. You will know that my discussions covered a wide range of trade policy matters, foreign investment, and various mineral, energy, and food commodities, and of course, the general nature of the developing relationship between Japan and Australia. Mr. Komoto and I agreed that we should take another look at the trade agreement between our countries. Mr. Seidenstecker, first of all, could you tell us how you became involved in translation and what was it that attracted you to it? I was required to learn the Japanese language during the war. I was an interpreter in first the United States Navy, then the United States Marine Corps. That was my first interest in Japan. I did not really acquire an interest in Japanese literature until after the war when I came to Japan and found it interesting. I uh, was drawn specifically to translation by, I suppose, a, a rather generous complex of things. I had, uh, by then, this was in the early 1950s, about 20 years ago, become something of a specialist, an academic specialist in modern Japanese literature. It was just then that the opportunities were beginning to emerge for translations, which is to say that American publishers were showing an interest. This was an extremely important factor. I think if it hadn't been for it, I wouldn't have done anything. After all, there's no point in translating if you're not going to have a publisher. And then there was the very simple fact that I thought it very good. What, um, what are the responsibilities, obligations, and difficulties that face the translator, especially with Japanese literature? The translator should be, I think I've, I've often said this, a translator should be a counterfeiter. And a counterfeiter is, very be is not a good counterfeiter if the article, if, if his product is better looking than the original. If uh, the counterfeiter produces a, a, a lovely American green bag in which George, on which George Washington is much, much handsomer than George Washington is on the original green bag. He's a bad counterfeiter. And I think that this is true of the translator, that uh, if there are blemishes in the original, if his George Washington is not a particularly handsome man, well, it's, it is his duty to make George Washington feature for feature precisely as he is in the original. The... Um, that's a very simple principle, but when you, uh, when you enter into practice, it, it's, it's by no means simple. You're always faced with alternatives. You're always finding yourself up against things that you cannot do. Every language says things differently from every other language. There are things that can be said in every language which can be said in no other language. Of the languages I know, I can, I can um, offer this as, a, it seems to me, an inc incontrovertible fact, the three, three European languages and two oriental languages that I have a 
working knowledge of, every one of them says things that cannot be said in any one of, in any of the other four. You come up against ambiguities, you come up, particularly in uh, good literature, you come up against the evocative quality, the, um, what, what, is, what is implicit rather than ex explicit. So that you're, you're constantly finding yourself up against choices and uh, the decision that you make in every one of these cases is an arbitrary one. Somebody else would have made a different decision and come up with something with a different kind of translation. What about the comment, though, most people I know, they'll pick up a translation of an English work and they'll say, it was an interesting book, but it read like a translatees. If the translation is of a work that is not sterile in the original, and it is sterile in translation, then very simply it's a bad translation, isn't it? Well, so what you do is, you're, you're very humble, I should say, you're very aware of the limitations, you're very aware of the fact that translation is a very, very rough net and that a great deal gets through and eludes the uh, translator's powers. You do your best and you hope that you're, that uh, with what powers you are master of in l English, it is in my case English, you are able to create something of the mood, something of the tone of the original. What you're saying, of course, is that so many translations are, have the literal sense of the original, but they lack the uh, tone, the color, the flavor of the original. Well, they're not good translations. Of course, there are some things that cannot be translated. I mean, there, 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 are, there are some things, and I should say that this is more true of poetry than it is of prose, from which the translator should either stay away or, in the case of which, he should admit that he's not going to produce anything like the He's not going to convey anything like the quality of the original. In prose, in extended prose, I think that there are, that there are ways in which the translator can work around the original. If he comes up against something that's untranslatable, if he comes up against something that, 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 that really seems to defy translation, he can sort of edge his way around it and go ahead and hope to, not perfectly, not ideally, but hope to convey a great deal of the mood, the tone, the quality of the original. So you say that translating is um, a recreative art in itself? Literary translation is, yes. Of course, there are all kinds of translation. If you translate the instructions for operating an elevator, that you, you can translate word for word uh, literally, and you don't have to worry about conveying a quality. But if you're translating literature, good literature, almost by definition, relies upon the evocative quality of language. And when you're working from a set which, from a set of words which convey, which uh, have connotations in one language, into a set of words which have quite different connotations, well, then yes, you are very definitely uh, in the realm of recreation. It is an artistic endeavor. Literary translation is most definitely an artistic endeavor. Kawabata was awarded the 1968 Nobel Prize for Literature. Would you like to comment upon this and to what extent your translation contributed to this? Well, I think, again, at a risk of seeming to praise myself, I think it's a very simple fact that it had a great deal to do with it. The Swedish Academy, which makes the... Swedish Academy of Letters, which makes the awards in literature, doesn't make awards to works to books it doesn't read and it doesn't read Japanese. And uh, my translations into English were the first considerable translations into any foreign language of Kawabata's writing, and they, I think they continued to be the ones most widely read, so without wishing to, uh, to um, uh, sound arrogant uh, at all, I think that the objective fact is that, the, that my translations did have a great deal to do with it. Mr. Kawabata said so, he very generously said so. Of course, that's not all. I mean, I, I go back to the fact that we had a good publisher. If we hadn't had a good publisher, none of this would have happened. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a bundle of things. It's no, no one thing can be... Uh, we had a very good author to work with. We had a generous and, uh, and uh, skillful and uh, conscientious publisher, and 
there was me, there, there was I to do the translation. All, all of these things were a part of it. Did you have many consultations with Mr. Kawabata over the translation of, say, Snow Country? No, next to none. I have not found that this is helpful. Authors don't usually like to talk about their work, you know. It's a strange thing, but they don't. And when you come up against something that, when you come up against the kind of difficulties that I have referred to earlier, they really don't have very much to say. I have consulted with Mr. Kawabata. I did consult with Mr. Kawabata, among others, when problems of this sort arose. But um, no, I think they're, they're problems that you have to come to terms with somehow by yourself. And I, 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 this, this is, I, would not, I certainly don't, don't wish to sound um, querulous or complaining, but I think that this is the, tr the simple truth. Writers don't, aren't very helpful in uh, problems having to do with translating translations of their own works. Um, I understand that at the moment you're translating the Genji Monogatari. In what way will this be different from Arthur Whaley's, shall we say, classic work? It will be very different. Uh, I never met Whaley, and I don't know of any context in which Whaley has elaborated upon his principles, his methods, when he translated the tale of Genji. But what Whaley does with the tale of Genji uh, is much more like what I would say an editor should do than what a translator should do. Uh, I earlier, you remember, made the, uh, made the distinction that between the work of the editor and the work of the translator. There are some things which an editor can do with the permission of the original author, which he can very properly do, but which I think the translator should not do. The translator should not gloss over weak points. The translator should not cut. The translator should not improve. Whaley did all of these things. He cut very boldly. That's not surprising. It's a very long work, and I was going to say something unfriendly, but so I'll take it back. Um, it's not surprising that he did this. Uh, I think rather more surprising is that he added a great deal. And I, I think quite simply that, according to my principles, by my lights, his is not a good translation. It may be a very brilliant job of editing. People are always saying that Whaley improved upon the original. I think probably he did, but. I don't think this is praise. It's very easy to improve upon a very uh, upon a long work of narrative prose. It's very easy. It's a constant struggle not to improve. Virtually every morning when you're at work on something like this, you say to yourself, oh, I wish he or she hadn't written that. And the temptation is very strong to pretend that he or she didn't. Um, and when you do that, when you cut, as Whaley did, you, I think, probably are improving. And if Whaley had been a translator, I think it would be high praise to say that he improved the original. But he was, if Whaley had been an editor, I'm sorry, it would have been high praise to say that he improved the original. I don't think it's praise to say that the translator improves the original. The much, much the harder thing is to be faithful. And um, my translation will certainly be much more faithful than Whaley's. It, it may not read as well as Whaley's. I don't know. That will be for you people to decide. But uh, it will certainly be more faithful. It will be a much better imitation of the original than the Whaley translation is. Some people have said that from some novels, especially from the historical point of view, that often it's necessary to make cuts in the book because there are certain references which to the foreigner mean absolutely nothing, but whereas to a Japanese person they would have great meaning. Is this also true in the Genji Monogatari? Well, we must remember that we're talking about a work that was written a thousand years ago, and it's just about as distant from the Japanese as it is from us. If you're talking about a work in modern literature, then there might be something to this. But when you're talking about the tale of Genji, no, I don't think so. I think that I don't think there's a great deal in it that means an enormous amount to a Japanese that doesn't mean anything to us. And after this is published, do you have plans for any other work that you'd like to tackle? 
Oh, yes. I have all number of plans, all manner of plans. I am at work at the moment on a collection of essays of my own essays, past and present, from 20 years or so ago down to the very recent past. Some of them have been published, some of them have not. The collection will be published early next year. And when that's out of the way, I've got lots of other things I want to do. I'd like to have a try at writing some fiction of my own, but perhaps that's merely a dream. We'll see. Today we're speaking with Mr. Mel Suji, who is a director on the board for the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Uh, the Correspondence Club has recently moved to new headquarters in the Urakucho Denki building, which is near Hibiya, from the Marunouchi district. Mr. Suji, can you give us a brief personal history? Um, well, the club... Um had its uh, origins, I guess, back uh, just after the war, and when in 1946 uh, the correspondents who were uh, who were here for the occupation and eventually after for the Korean War started, uh, they needed some sort of uh, central uh, office, and uh, which and what evolved out of this was the Foreign Correspondents Club. At that time, they had uh, something like uh, rooms, like a hotel for for the correspondents and they provided interpreters and stuff like that. Now, all that's changed, of course, uh, uh, in the course of, what, is it 20, 30-odd years? And now it's um, basically a, a businessman's club which provides luncheons and, and, and a forum with, for speakers and world leaders to come here. Now it has approximately, let's see, 1,900 members, um, of which 300 are regular members, uh, which means they are uh, journalists or uh, or for our former, cor former foreign correspondents. Of this, one third of the regular members are Japanese. Now of the approximately estimated 1,300 associate members who are businessmen, about one quarter of those are Japanese. Um, it's been rumored among Japanese journalists especially, that foreign correspondents who are dispatched to Tokyo, especially those from the States, Canada, and, say, Europe, are not necessarily the best qualified. They are, they say that they are generally second or third-rate newsmen. And the reason for this is because most Westerners feel that Japan is not a country that is of very much interest to the rest of the world. What, do you have an opinion on that topic? I have very many opinions on that, but I don't think we should, uh, we could, we, uh, I don't think there's enough time to uh, go into all that. But uh, as for the criticism, I think it's typical of the kind of criticism that would come out of uh, the Japanese journalistic industry. Because for one thing, the, uh, admittedly, there probably is not the kind of interest in Japan and Asia that there should be in the West. But uh, it's changing, and it's been changing for the better. And the people they send out here generally are uh, very capable men. Fine, they don't probably don't know much about Japan, but uh, given the requirements and the deadlines of daily journalism, daily newspaper journalism, they do a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, in November of 1974, uh, Prime Minister Tanaka was forced to resign from his position. And it was said that a prime uh, factor in his resignation was the conference, the press conference that was held at the press club, um, in which the foreign correspondents grilled him about his financial difficulties at the time. What can you say about that? Well, um, I think uh, from a Japanese perspective, it may be termed grilled, but I don't agree that uh, we grilled uh, Mr. Tanaka because I think Mr. Tanaka was treated like any speaker who comes to the club in the sense that uh, we asked the kind of questions that need, needed to be asked because up to that time, Mr. Tanaka had not been asked the important questions. Why? 
Well, uh, if you examine it, uh, I think the main reasons are the, the peculiar characteristics of Japanese journalism. They just don't ask the kind of questions. And that's why sometimes we have uh, a little, a few problems about, uh, say, is a joint uh, press conference between the Japan Press Club and the Foreign Correspondents Club. Well, with the Japan Press Club, there are many restrictions on how you're going to ask questions, what questions to ask. And if, if the press conference is held at the Foreign Correspondents Club here, there's just no restrictions. You can ask anything and, any, and everything. So uh, that's why, um, depending on who you talk to, uh, you know, you're going to get a different viewpoint on the matter. Um, the article about Mr. Tanaka's financial problems uh, had already been published before he came to the Correspondence Club, and you just mentioned this, the pe peculiarities of the Japanese journalist. Um, why was it, do you suppose, that the article in the magazine, which eventually uh, exposed Tanaka, was almost totally ignored by the Japanese press until after? the co press conference at the press club? Well, I think that situation tells, uh, if, you, if we could get into it, tells a lot about the characteristics of the Japanese uh, press because uh, I think the, uh, the press establishment here is very elitist, and very, for want of a better term, let's call it arrogant. Uh, because you take, for example, just the ministries. There are them and us, so to speak, okay? The big papers have a press club onto themselves. The other papers, another press club. Why it's separated, I don't know. And uh, when a little uh, weekly magazine, well, it's not so little, but uh, insignificant in the sense of uh, when you compare it to papers like Asahi Shimbun, Mainichi Shimbun, and so on. When a, uh, when a weekly magazine dares to come out with a story that exposes something like that and really beats the press, the daily press on the story, well, you know, the, in Japan, they uh, just don't do that kind of thing. As a result, it, it's avoided. And plus the fact that the press here really is, does not do the investigative job that it should do, like, for example, big papers would do in the West. And uh, I think because of that, uh, only when it was, uh, when the story was surfaced in the Foreign Correspondents Club did it take on the kind of importance that it should have. Um, you mentioned the Japanese press clubs. Can you describe a little bit more exactly what they are? Are they the same, do they have the same function and purpose as the Foreign Correspondents Club? Well, in very broad general terms, yes, but uh, I think you would call them, let's say, uh, if, the, if in the West, I think their counterpart would be a kind of bureau. Uh, say in the ministries, for example, all of the ministries have a press club. And what it is is a room provided, uh, a big room provided for all the newspapers. They have desks, and everything that goes out of a ministry will be funneled or channeled through this press club. And um, anything of importance that is done by a journalist in one of these or one of these papers out of these press clubs really has to have these, uh, the endorsement of the press club. So in effect, it, uh, it kind of inhibits uh, what, personal initiative, investigative initiative, stuff like that. So if a, if a person, if a journalist does happen to get uh, a scoop or how he finds out something, he really does not have much, uh, how should we call it, um, opportunity to do it because he will be kind of shunned or vetoed in the club. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, things like this are broken in the, week, in the weekly magazines. Do you find uh, for yourself or among any of your colleagues that this makes it a bit more frustrating to work as a journalist in Japan? The fact that you are, are you, for example, every time barred from press conferences or uh, that sort of thing, uh, where only the Japanese newsmen are allowed? Well, I can speak from personal experience on that because, uh, for one thing, if a journalist relies upon uh, press club or any group organization to get a story, he's not going to get much of a story. 
So, but on the other hand, uh, a forum like an or forum and an organization like the Foreign Correspondents Club is indispensable in a country like Japan and Asia. But on the other hand, for example, if you're doing stories peculiar to your country, in you know, my, my respect, Canada, okay? For example, uh, uh, and the government team from Ontario came here uh, to do investigate uh, and to get some information on the Minamata disease in Kyushu. So they had a, a press conference, or they held talks at the Environment Agency. Well, you know, I was told that they were there, so I went over and I, I walked into the, uh, the press club there thinking that the pr uh, press conference would probably be held there. Well, I arrived early, fortunately, because uh, when I arrived there, I didn't get a very warm greeting because, uh, so to speak, that, you know, I wasn't welcome there. And I, sh I you know, uh, this is only for the reporters of the Environment Agency. Well, that kind of teed me off a bit. But fortunately, they had not finished their talks. So I went upstairs and had a talk with uh, some of the people and uh, some of the Canadian Embassy people were there. So I kind of sidled along with them. I kind of went along with them downstairs to the press club and uh, sat with in their section, and they didn't say anything to me. <laughs> it works. <laughs> there are ways and means of getting about uh, around these barriers, but, you know, they are there and they can be imposing.